So let's like call all the participants outside the room, come back to the conference room so that we could start the session this morning. Uh, the session uh, for this morning is about activity and see sources of conflict or areas for cooperation. Uh, the moderator is Professor Khalid Athea, University of New South Wales at the Australian Defence Force Academy of Australia. Professor Thayer, you have floor. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, I had 20 years as a soccer referee, five on the National League, and I always had to wait. I always had to wait until the television crews told me I could start the game. So I was looking over here to begin. There's a heavy burden on us today because we're, we don't, we're going to be discussing cooperation and con, uh, cooper, conflict and cooperation, but we really want to end today with some innovative and practical and positive uh, suggestions for the way forward rather than being pessimistic. So we can use our expertise, but for peace, cooperation, and development, one of the themes of this uh, conference, bring it forward. We have uh, three speakers. In the, I won't provide detailed biography, but our first, Professor Zhang Rengping, uh, is director of the Center for International Maritime Convention Studies at Dalian Maritime University in China, will lead off, and, and then I'll introduce each speaker in turn. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Thayer, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I need my presentation to show on the screen. Lovely. It is a really great pleasure to be invited to this uh, conference. First of all, I have to say thank you to the, you know, the Diplomatic uh, Academy of the Vietnam for invitation, and uh, also my thanks go to the Secretary, a party secretary, for his hosting of last delicious dinner. We did enjoy very much. I, I'm, sh I'm sure everybody enjoyed. My topic, I will try to be short and brief within the time frame. My topic will be on the maritime cooperation for the regional security in the South China Sea. Should be working. Wrong, wrong button. And uh, by looking at the status quo in the South China Sea for the shipping and for the ports, by looking at the movement of the marine technology trains, then we come to the cooperation side. Then my conclusion will quickly give you a very brief idea of what what to do next. What is the status quo of the shipping industry in the South China Sea? Now let's take a look at the global view. That is the shipping routes of the global view. Most recently, we know the international sea, sea bond trade accounts to about 80% of the total world trade volume. If say by volume, if by the value, it accounts to about 70%. And by the start of this year, what is the global fleet, commercial or merchant fleet looks like? We have about 93,000 merchant vessels operating around the world, consisting of 1.86 million or billion deadweight tonnage. So that is that diagram gives you the top three countries owning the most of owning the fleet: Germany, China, and Greece. 39 percent of the world fleet. That diagram gives you the, I do need my binoculars. I can't see from here. Gosh, I don't have my copy, hard copy here. But there is still the, the US, I mean, sorry, not US. I think that's uh, flank states. Panama, uh, Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. Yes, thank you. Uh, that is the top three leaders uh, in the shipbuilding, China, Japan, and Korea. Now here, diagram gives you the view that the top 10 countries owning the fleet. 
it goes to the Greece, then Japan, China, and uh, Germany, Singapore. So Asian countries, I mean, two of them are within the top five. That is the general scenario or situation of the world fleet. Now, let's take a look at this uh, World Maritime Day theme for the 2017. It's uh, connecting, sorry, if you look at the left at the bottom, connecting port, ship, and people. Then we come to the theme. It just highlights the cooperation between ports and ships to enhance the safe and the secure maritime transport system. That is the whole. Shipping is the most international and the most dangerous one. That is for sure. What about the 20, top 20 countries of the registry of the shipping? I'm not looking at the top 20. I'm looking at this, uh, like, uh, this Asian perspective, like Singapore, top five, China, eight, Indonesia, top 15. I just give you the idea. So the rest, are, that is also the general situation of this uh, shipping fleet by country. All right. Talking about the ship or shipping, we can't operate our ship without ports. What about the ten, top 10 ports in the world? By this year, we got ten, uh, top 10 ports. They are all Asian ports, and seven are the Chinese ports. That is the whole scenario of the China, Asian ports, all in the Southeast Asia country, uh, areas, but only one in the Middle East. It's uh, Dubai. And uh, coming to the port, we still need to cope with the new trends of development. We have uh, several factors to consider. The MEC ships, MEC alliance, and the cybersecurity of the port operation. So that is the factors we need to consider. In that case, the container terminal scenario, the world top one is Asian, the terminal, I mean, container terminal operation. Now let's take a look at the whole scenario of the Southeast Asian countries. That is the general idea, but the, it's a little out, out of date. That's the data I can get. And that is the figure we can see about ASEAN and China. This figure is the last year's figure, about 100,000 transit from Malacca Strait every year. About 80% vessels are for China. And this is the scenario for the last year. We've got about 96,000 more vessels transit in the south, uh, transiting in the South China Sea, representing about 90% of the global fleet from more than 50 countries. Those in that case, I need to say the South China Sea still remains highly shipping density and a vital shipping lane. That is status quo. Now we take a look at the future trends of the marine technology. I just give you a very short, brief idea of the marine technology trend in the next 20 or 30 years. The International Maritime Organization has recently held a meeting on the Maritime Safety Committee issues. One of the important issues was the maritime autonomous surface ship. Among others, we have. In short, it's called MARS. MARS scoping exercise is agreed upon by all the member states, while the IMO, in short, is asked to take a leading and a proactive role to tackle this uh, mass scoping exercise issues. In that case, we need to look at the several factors like uh, the human element, maritime safety, and the security. That is one of the aspects we need to look at. The other areas include, we need to consider, include the legal aspects that mass could bring us, the responsibility in mass, both sides. That is the very brief touch of this um, marine technology. For the maritime cooperation in the South China Sea, we need to look at the shipping, we need to like look at the ports, we need to like the marine environment issues. That is the general idea of this. Uh, for the port cooperation, the Malaysia Minister, Transport Minister, 
provided us the evidence that three, another two Chinese ports also joined the alliance, coming to the 21 ports. For the maritime, for the marine environmental protection area, we need to think about the ACAR. We know there are four ACARs in the world. While uh, originally we don't have anything, but China's gov Chinese government has uh, set up three ACARs within the Chinese coastal waters, starting from 2016, and will gradually upgrade it by 2020 to the highest standard. That is the area. From the north, it's called Bohe Bay, and uh, we, we have the middle, it's uh, Yangtze River, and we have the South Pearl River, those are three acres. And the time frame started from 2016 to 2020. And with this four ports to start, increased to more than 10 or 20 ports. So all the ships sailed to the Chinese coastal areas must follow or comply with these Chinese uh, standards of the requirements. Coming to the PSSA, we have uh, examples uh, by the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and uh, Indonesia. The Philippines set a very successful example in this uh, area, to Bataha. And the Malaysia set another good example in Malacca Straits. While the Vietnam tried to set up, set up another, another, another example in Halong Bay. So, the last one is the Ind Indonesia, and uh, that is a very hot place, more recently, with a volcano in Bali, right? Very close to Bali Island. That is uh, the area from Indonesia. So we need to think, think of the, all this. Another practical area of cooperation is uh, maritime search and rescue. Last month, the Chinese government has organized the SAR exercise in the southern part of China and they invited six other Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, with 20, more than 20 ships and three helicopters joined the operation. The three, the Brunei, Cambodia, Long, Myanmar, the Philippines, the Thailand, they all sent their observers, delegates to join this, uh, you know, the exercises. That is the whole scenario for our maritime cooperation. And this, for autonomous ship, we need to consider how this could affect our legal regime in our future. Because autonomous ship is not something that we just try to like play as a toy or maneuver like whatever you like. But it's really something affecting our, our maritime security. In conclusion, we need to look at the recent events. And also we need to consider four C's, confidence, capacity, cooperation, and uh, connectivity of the facilities. By this, I'm focusing on the last one, people-to-people -people exchange. The examples are cruise tourism. We need to increase our people-to-people -e -people exchange. We need our curious, tourist uh, tourism, like by cruise, visiting our neighboring countries, and we need to have a maritime search and rescue ready, and we need to protect our environment. That is the 100-year historical event or disaster, if you could remember, Titanic, with more than uh, 15,000 people lost their life. What about 100 years later? We still have another tragedy, the Costa Concordia. In 2012, this cruise ship went aground. So my question is, are we ready or prepared ready for this kind of a mass rescue operation in the South China Sea? What do we should do to ensure the safe and more sec safer and more secure voyage in the South China Sea? China and the Southeast Asian countries need to work together for the security, for the region security. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang. For land lovers like myself, that was a tour de force of the global maritime and shipping industry, and then bringing the focus into Southeast Asia. 
highlighting the role of external as well as, in particular, uh, regional actors themselves. So we now turn to uh, Shafia Mohibat, who is the Senior Fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Jakarta, uh, and she's with the Maritime Security Program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Thank you, Chair. Um, very good morning to everyone. Um, thank you to um, DAV for organizing this um, very important um, conference. Um, my apologies for not preparing a, a PowerPoint presentation, but I, um, I have a full paper um, in your booklet, and I'm going to be only referring to the, you know, the most important points um, in, in my presentation to that uh, paper. Um, this session is called um, Activities at Sea, um, you know, Sources of Conflict and Areas for Cooperation. Um, turning back to this um, very um, important topic is that you see that there are certain activities um, at sea that can be both sources of conflict and can be also areas for cooperation. Um, yesterday, I think um, throughout the various sessions, we touched upon issues of illegal fishing. So um, in this session, I'm going to be um, uh, looking at that topic as well um, on illegal fishing, but mostly on the efforts to, you know, to enforce um, legal measures um, to prevent um, illegal fishing, IOU fishing in general. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to be taking a look at, um, you know, uh, the cases of Indonesia um, and why Indonesia. I'm, 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 I'll explain it, um, um, in a very short moment. Um, I don't think I have to sort of like. Um, re-emphasize on why IU fishing is uh, is a serious problem. Um, we've discussed this um, in various sessions yesterday as well. Um, but also, I think yesterday we touched upon on how, you know, states need to, um, you know, um, enhance um, the st st stronger measures to make sure that, um, you know, IU fishing doesn't occur, at least in their um, respective um, territorial um, uh, maritime areas. Um, in this regard, uh, in this particular um, region, um, including um, at, at parts of the South China Sea, um, um, IU fishing is indeed a serious problem. And in the past uh, few years, um, Indonesia has been highlighted as one country that has been um, sort of like um, creating a very hard-hitting policy against um, illegal fishing, especially since 2014 with the new president who uh, enforced a series um, hard measures um, to combat um, illegal fishing in Indonesia's territory. Um, one of the one of the policies that has been, you know, you, you would find it highlighted in the media is Indonesia's current policy of sinking the foreign vessels caught uh, conducting illegal fishing in Indonesia's waters. Um, this is this is only one of the measures taken by, by the government, but it is the one policy that has, you know, gained um, very strong media coverage, mainly because um, when you when you do certain this kind of policy, a very hard um, harsh line policy, you uh, tend to create tension with your neighbors because uh, the, war, the, the 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 countries where these foreign vessels come from are usually your neighbors. Uh, and this would create um, um, a kind of um, tension, of course, with, with your neighboring countries. So I would see this particular, um, you know, nexus between law enforcement and illegal fishing, where uh, it can be seen as both, uh, you know, a source of conflict. You know, again, like I said, when you blow up fish from your neighbor's um, um, fishing fleet, of course, it's going to create conflict and tension in the region. But on the other hand. Um, all countries in the region also acknowledge that illegal fishing is a serious problem, so it should be an area for cooperation as well. Um, as of September this year, um, you, you read the reports in the media, Indonesia has reportedly sunk 317 foreign vessels, which is a, a large number um, um, of vessels. Um, other than that, um, of course, because this particular policy, the blowing up of the, the, the sinking of the vessels, uh, is generally you know very highlighted by the media. The Indonesian officials uh, have been keen to emphasize that there are other uh, measures taken as well. So not only the the, the hard hitting blowing up the the, the vessels uh, policy, but they have also been you know um, for example they established a, a ministerial task force uh, on the prevention and eradication of IUU fishing um, from November. 2014 until October 2015, uh, they had a one-year moratorium uh, of all foreign-built fishing vessels weighing more than uh, 20 gross tons that were licensed to operate in Indonesia. Interestingly, uh, this moratorium was used to conduct um, 
uh, investigation on 1,132 fishing permits that had been given to foreign vessels to see whether they had been misused. The result of this audit uh, was interesting because uh, a number of violations and criminal offenses were actually found. This included, among other things, first, of course, uh, the, 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 the common uh, misuse is fishing outside the permitted fishing grounds. So um, the license would include certain fishing grounds, but then it was misused to also conduct fishing outside of the permitted fishing grounds. Um, second is the use of destructive fishing methods uh, and equipment. Uh, and then there's also the turning off of transmitters during operations at sea, illegal transshipments of the catches offshore, and uh, lastly, and I think this is um, one that has uh, brought the biggest loss for Indonesia, is the exporting catches without customs checks and proper documentation. Um, so this is bas basically Indonesia um, trying to you know, conduct um, several measures to make sure that um, illegal fishing is reduced in, in, in its territorial border. However, as I highlighted, South China Sea dispute. Um, one of the one of the uh, biggest um, one of one of the um, highlight of, of last year, for example, uh, are the incidences in near the Natuna waters, where Indonesia's EEZ would be um, you know would overlap with China's um, nine dash line. So there were at least three incidences with China with Chinese uh, fishing vessels. Um, which were, you know, it was covered uh, highly by the media and see, you know, the, the, it, which created serious uh, tensions uh, in the bilateral relations between Indonesia uh, and China. Um, interestingly, before that, in 2015, before this very um, uh, high profile incidents, incidents um, in the Natuna uh, waters, uh, in 2015, actually, Indonesia um, sunk the first uh, Chinese fishing vessels. And the media, the media wrong statement to Beijing um, with regards to uh, to the Ch South China Sea disputes. Uh, so not not only China, uh, Indonesia's policy is of course, like I said, uh, would create tensions with neighboring countries as well. Uh, in this regard, I would like to highlight Vietnam, because um, uh, of the 300, I, I don't have the exact numbers, I don't have the exact percentage, but from, from the 317 fishing vessels that were sunk, that had been sunk until this until September this. But seriously, um, um, in, and naturally, uh, there is a strong voice of concern and protest from, from Vietnam that's, that's coming towards Indonesia as well, which is um, particularly understood. Uh, even um, domestically, because the, the, the blowing up the, uh, the, the vessels is a policy of our fisheries ministry, uh, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of Foreign Affairs has actually voiced their concerns as well because they don't particularly agree with such hard-hitting policy. Um, as their main concern is, of course, creating you know um, harmony with our neighboring states. In this case, you know, states in, in Southeast Asia, um, member states of ASEAN. So, looking at this big picture, there is clearly a dilemma here. First time uh, when states actually, you know, seek um, uh, seeks an effort to actually carry out such um, measurements, um, uh, and because this problem is transnational, there there is bound to be tension with the neighboring states. So this is where the dilemma sort of lays out. Um, um, in this regard, I think um, uh, the, ba the, the the key here is of course uh, cooperation. Um, uh, in my paper, I stated that Indonesia should continue to to build up their maritime enforcement and management capacities to enhance compli compliance. Um, this sort of like, I, 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 I try to look at it from um, making a parallel to um, problems with piracy and sea robbery. Um, you know, ASEAN countries um, have all kinds of different um, areas of cooperation when they try to deal with, to reduce the number of piracy in the region. But handling the root causes of piracy usually lays with the the, the countries where the pirates come from. So in, in case of, uh, for example, in the Malacca Straits, there was efforts um, in the Indonesian side of, of, of the Malacca Straits to actually improve the sort of like the economic um, condition um, of people living on the shore so that they don't, where the countries where the, the fishermen are from should also, you know, um, at the same time while, co uh, while conducting cooperation with other neighboring countries, at the same time countries where, where uh, the, the fishermen are from should also take stronger measures to, to, to make sure that they, uh, the fishermen don't resort to conducting IU fishing um, um, at sea. Um, while, act, while having um, this 
sort of like domestic um, measures uh, in terms of new policies to, con uh, to combat IU fishing. Indonesia has also at the same time, because I, I stress the key is cooperation, um, tried a, both a regional and global effort to um, enhance cooperation. Indonesia's quote unquote campaigning for is to uh, have a recognition of IUU fishing as a transnational crime, something that has not been fully supported by, by a lot of other countries um, due to you know different um, reasons and different factors. Uh, uh, so far, um, I had an interview with some people at the Indonesian Foreign Ministry, and they said that so far in ASEAN, uh, Indonesia is still the lone ranger, is, this is what they call it, a lone ranger in trying to um, get IU fishing recognized as a transnational crime. Um, so uh, in a lot of, I, I think in a lot of, um, from, from what's at Mahir, and I think, um, I, and, and I, I, I mentioned again that the key here um, is cooperation. Uh, but one thing for sure is that as the region is already strained due to the South China Sea disputes, uh, Indonesia needs indeed to be extra careful, you know, because although it has the right to impose national law in its territory, um, effect, effective solutions still require multilateral cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. So we had a zones, <laughs> and at the same time creating tensions with countries whose fishermen intrude into that zone, leading to the question of cooperation and educating fishermen to obey the laws, but also to improve in the longer term uh, the socioeconomic conditions. Just to make that parallel with piracy, uh, an Indonesian admiral once said to the practitioner, uh, a great friend of mine, Captain Martin uh, Sebastian, uh, retired uh, Royal Malaysian Navy, senior fellow and head of the Center for Maritime Security and Diplomacy at MIMA, the Maritime Institute of Malaysia, one of the foremost think tanks in the region uh, dealing with maritime issues. So I'll turn it over, Martin. Uh, and I also like to thank those operating the computer for my PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'll continue. Um, this is my presentation scope. Uh, I start with maritime security, and of course, we'll talk about some trends. As the top, uh, Frecken uh, was in the middle. He talks about socio-economic development in the coastal environment. Uh, what Dr. Sharifa mentioned just now: sustainable development required for these societies, and these drives the crimes that we see because they become the logistic support for these unscrupulous uh, kingpins that uh, operate, and he talks about those with the tattoo and the tie. So we should go after those with the tie, not the ones with the tattoo. And uh, Karsten, he talks about the whole mechanics of the crime, the logistics, and how they work as a business. Uh, for me, uh, I would on land, the fixers are on land, um, the forgers are all on land, more than 70% of those involved in piracy are actually on land. So all these businesses that we see, uh, uh, smuggling, trafficking, illegal fishing, piracy, armed robbery, they're all business. These businesses run a shadow economy, and uh, as what uh, the moderator mentioned just now, uh, we need to start to address them on land. So as we see Abu Sayyaf that uh, are becoming more notorious now in the South China Sea, uh, they have become from pirates to terrorists, and uh, i give you an example, uh, the MV Royal 16. On the 11th of November 2016, uh, Sulu based one crew and they kidnapped six. So it's just not uh, piracy, it's also terrorism, and later one of the kidna uh, those kidnapped was killed. And then comes the Vietnamese fishing vessel on the 10th of November. The Philippines Navy rescued four out of five. Um, somehow or other, uh, one of them died actually of disease. So when you reflect uh, piracy to terrorism, we need to go back to what uh, terror can do. So on the 7th of February 20 2004, the Abu Sayyaf set up a bomb in Super Ferry. Actually, they loaded a TV uh, with 3.8 kilos of TNT and they left it in the lower decks. So it exploded and uh, is connected to it. And to us, it's a sinking target. So what kind of security concerns? That can be just attacked by an offshore support vessel loaded with explosives. And there's militancy right now. Uh, there's a lot of encroachment around those FPSOs. The security is on the vessel. They are not around the vessel. What the vessel have? is according to ISPS code and uh, unclosed 500 meters of navigation safety, that's all. And 500 meters is not enough to stop a terrorist attack. So if you look at trends of piracy to terrorism, I hope uh, you can see it's clear enough. It started off with sea people who, you know, palm oil um, uh, tankers and later went to fuel tankers. And then we saw the attack on Super Ferry. 
and then we see fishermen being kidnapped and um, for ransom in the Sulu Sea and then we see attacks on ship crew and beheading and so what next? From these trends what can we see? That what's forthcoming? We see a least probable but more dangerous threat. Uh, we heard today, uh, earlier today on the threats to um, cruise liners but what if a cruise liner is hijacked and slams on a FPSO? You get 4th of July for one and a half months and a whole devastation of the sea. And if you see the um, deep water horizon, then, but whilst organized crime have its nexus from land and sea, the security is divided. Land is land, sea is sea. So the sea people don't talk to the land people. So they think maritime security is a maritime matter. So that this division have to be uh, changed. A new look has to be done. And for that, we need to look back at this business, the crime model. The crime, cr crime operates in a shadow economy, and we need to reduce this gap from legitimate economy to shadow economy. For that, we need to do capacity building. We need to look back at sustainable development, sustainable environment. And right now, uh, we have, uh, if you look at transnational organized crime, they are borderless. Nothing stops them. They can, they can conduct their business throughout the region. But if you see how we are set up, single maritime point of context have been set up. There's national maritime security system in Singapore. There's uh, Badan Kamanan Laut in Indonesia. Thank you. You have National Maritime Coordinating Center in Brunei. You have uh, National Coast Watch Center in Philippines. You have the Thai Maritime, all the enforcement agencies sitting in one building, analyzing everything together, putting the jigsaws, and then addressing uh, what we need to address. Most important in law enforcement is effective conviction. It's not arrest, it's not indictment. It's busting the syndicates, targeting the supply chain, increasing the cost to the crime, and then doing outreach and uh, bringing in all the other risk mitigation, and of course, bring gold. So that means all of us have to work together to, to address transnational organized crime, piracy, terrorism, and if we all do our part as a region, we can put these crime syndicates out of business. With that, I'd like to thank you. Depth of that theme of the connection between piracy, transnational crime, terrorism, the land-based focus, and a whole of government one. And I think it re uh, relates to the earlier one where Malaysia is pushing for the illegal fishing. Uh, sorry, Indonesia is pushing to have illegal fishing. So I've recognized you. Uh, and I'll take a bunch of questions because we have uh, up, uh, up to 9.50. Uh, 34 minutes uh, of question and answer time. There's a clock up here. Uh, and we'll see how we go. So first up, Morris Rand Corporation. I want to ask a question to, to Ms. Can you get closer to the mic? Yeah. Yes, Lyle Morris Rand Corporation. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Ms. Uh, Muhabat uh, about Indonesia's uh, blowing up of the fishermen. Would you assess that this campaign has been successful? Uh, and by successful, I mean what are the markers of success that they're, they're cracking down, but an actual being effective of stopping the value fishing, there isn't much data to back up what they're doing is effective. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen over here. Uh, uh, right yes. here and then next to you, then you'll be third. It's okay, it's Fabio Marcelli of the Research Director in the Institute for International Legal Studies of the National Research Council of Italy. Uh, given the various problematics which were analyzed by our speakers, uh, that is illegal uh, fishing, for instance, or environmental problems, or security problems in the area. Uh, my question to all three. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Hello, I'm uh, from the Foreign Service Institute of the Philippines. Uh, this is for Ms. Muhibat. Um, make if IUU fishing is considered a transnational crime. Perhaps this is also a question for um, Captain Sebastian and also for Ms. Muhibat. Why, why is there resistance or opposition to um, Indonesia's campaign to make IUU fishing a transnational crime? Thank you. Are there any other hands up? Well, so one question to Professor Rinping. Uh, under the existing um, uh, international legal framework, um, which uh, maritime co cooperation for um, security 
and for reason we'll meet uh, Sha Fia. Well, you uh, you did touch up on uh, the issues of uh, blowing or sinking of uh, foreign vessels allegedly uh, caught um, illegal term, uh, fishing in uh, also the Indonesian claimed uh, waters. So to, uh, given the fact that uh, well, Vietnam and I Indonesia are negotiating or I mean uh, to nego negotiating to um, uh, EZ limitation. I mean, to, uh, well, given the fact that uh, there is, uh, to my understanding, a number, uh, quite a number of Vietnamese fishing vessels conducted fishing in this area uh, had been to, uh, captured or arrested by in Indonesian um, law enforcement. And uh, in this regard, I also to believe that a number of, the, uh, of the v those vessels caught in this area had been uh, well, sunk or blown by one way or another way. And uh, well, to me, do you think it is uh, well, well, do you think um, it is right for Indonesia, Indonesia to do it, given the fact that uh, Indonesia is also under the obligation to ex exercise self-restraint and also exercise cooperation, to, uh, well, at least in terms of uh, fighting um, some kind of provision arrangement? Pending a solution for the the overlapping uh, area. Thank, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, and I also have one question for um, Captain Martin. Uh, at the very beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that maritime security is everything about um, piracy, uh, well, trafficking, or uh, terrorism. Uh, I just want you to uh, clarify do you, whether you. I think maritime security is everything about non-traditional issues, threats, or it also covers traditional ones. Thank you. Right, okay, I'll take one more question for this panel. It's the person behind the cameraman whose hand went up, but I can't see now. But I can't have the cameraman move. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a uh, I have few question to Captain Sebastian, as he uh, mentioned the new concept of uh, maritime security. So uh, I am from Bangladesh. This is Hassan Tariq Choudhury. I am representing International Association of Democratic Lawyers here. So uh, from the Bangladeshi experience, we are facing the piracy of Myanmar pirates in the Bay of Bengal. And uh, and also we are we have experience of the illegal transportation of weapons uh, using the maritime boundary. So uh, I would like to ask a question to Captain Sebastian that uh, uh, do, do you have any idea regarding the Asian uh, Maritime Security Alliance uh, composed by the naval security forces in this region? And uh, one thing another that uh, do you have any amendment proposal? Uh, to the international uh, maritime law to combat uh, piracy and protect maritime security. Thank you. How do we want to begin? Do you want to do that? Okay. We just reached consensus here on the batting order. So <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Um, try my best to address them one by one. So first question about um, this policies, whether it's successful. Um, I'll try to um, answer in using three points. So first, um, the sinking of the vessels is only one part of the policy. So um, the biggest, I think the biggest um, effort that was done was the moratorium uh, that was done to the existing um, permits. In that 
in this particular point, um, it, this, this policy has been successful because we have cleared out, basically Indonesia has cleared out, um, you know, those permits that has been misused. And um, those licenses were then revoked and not issued um, anymore. So in, in this regard, um, basically clearing up the field, the existing field of what, it, what, what is legal and what is not legal in that part of the moratorium was successful. Um, second of all, um, in terms of um, creating deterrence, um, yes, um, in a way that um, you see in certain um, in certain areas, um, I'm, I'm, I really don't have the numbers, but um, reports say that uh, in in some areas uh, where it used to be overfished, um, it's it's now um, slowly you know um, the, the fish the fish stocks um, as, uh, is, is returning back to normal. Um, however, uh, I guess I can relate this to um, to the last question about the, the, the easy, easy overlaps uh, with Vietnam, for example. Um, in a way that we do recognize this problem, and in uh, specifically on this point with regards to the overlap of EEZ with our neighboring countries, um, this particular uh, policy has not been successful because um, 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 it is done in a way that has not sort of like um, taken into account uh, the existing problems with uh, the existing um, negotiations with the neighboring countries. So in a lot of ways, it, it has created tension. And in and, and this point, I wouldn't say that it has been successful. Um, uh, and lastly, the, 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 the third point um, in measuring success is actually looking at Indonesia's own uh, fishing industry. And in this point, um, I also would say that the, the policy has not been successful. Why? Um, because although um, foreign vessels have been deterred to conduct, from conducting illegal fishing within Indonesia territory, and although, uh, like I said, in some places the fishing stock um, has you know, returned somewhat back to normal, uh, but it has not improved Indonesia's fisheries industries because first we do not have the capability to actually exploit all of these resources that exist. We have a very small uh, fishing uh, fleet compared to the vast area, uh, and we don't have the facilities, for example, cold storage, um, um, production, and, and you know um, uh, all of these um, um, capacities in um, fishing industries, which means that although uh, there are now less um, illegal fishing vessels, there are probably more uh, fishing stocks that exist. There is still not enough fish in. In, with, in, in the country. So not, so not only, not even talking about exporting more, but actually to, um, to um, fill all the demands within the country, it, it is still not, not enough. So in, in this regard, uh, I wouldn't say it has been um, quite effective in that particular regard. Um, the question about um, are you fishing uh, as transnational crime? Um, Interestingly, I'm, I'm going to refer to um, our Minister for Maritime and Fisheries made a, um, uh, a presentation at a UN meeting um, earlier this year, so uh, in which she um, made the case for making illegal fishing as transnational, transnational crime. So basically, um, what, he, what she argues is that classifying as such would allow countries to get assistance from organizations such as Interpol and UNODC, you know, for their own efforts in eradicating transnational crime. Um, uh, and not only that, um, because uh, because of the transnational nature uh, of uh, IUU fishing uh, problems, uh, recognizing as transnational, transnational crime would then demand serious um, collaboration from other countries as well. Uh, that's that's one uh, one side of um, of my answer. The second um, is the question: Why the, is there resistance? This is a bit difficult to answer. So maybe um, you know. Um, friends from other ASEAN countries can help me out on this. But from, okay, uh, Martin said he would do it, thank you. But from what I understand is that because um, this goes back to the dilemma, the, uh, the uh, dilemma that I mentioned earlier, that this is uh, this effort is bound to create tensions with neighboring countries. Countries that are already not happy with the way Indonesia is handling IU fishing uh, in the region, you know, the, 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 the harsh, the hard-hitting policy, would naturally be unhappy for Indonesia to take it one step forward to actually recognizing as a as a transnational crime. So basically, this um, resistance to um, um, 
to have a, a, a stronger policy because and, and I think uh, at the same uh, at, at, at the same time is also this a lot of ASEAN countries are still trying to figure out their domestic um, regulations with regards to IUU fishing so before they they're done with their domestic um, problems uh, I, I I would I would think that they would refuse to uh, take any uh, harder stance on uh, on, on illegal fishing. So back to the question of EE's question is about you know whether or not I think it is right. I think it is wrong. So I, I fully agree. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, there are voices of strong concerns uh, from within Indonesia, especially from the foreign ministry, with regards to this whole activity of um, you know chasing the illegal uh, fishing vessels from from our neighboring countries. Um, so you're right. It's not it, it, it's not right. Um, there should be uh, a more, like I said in my presentation, Indonesia needs to be extra careful uh, in, in handling these issues. Um, again, back to the moratorium, it's good because it's um, it already clears out, um, you know, uh, all the um, misuse and illegal activities that that existed before. But to actually add up to the problem with, um, you know, connecting it with issues of. Um, 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 territorial um, border nego easy negotiations, then that would be a very, um, a very uh, risky thing to do for Indonesia. Martin, thank you, Carl. A uh, couple of questions have been directed to me. I'll just uh, hop on to, I'll just hop on to Dr. Sharifah's uh, subject. IUU. IUU is a transnational organized crime. Why? Because it is not about fisheries only. It's also about human trafficking, transshipment, fish laundering, um, cloning of vessels, uh, drug trade, arms trade, everything at sea. So we need to get those movers and shakers on land. Corrupted government officials, last week we caught seven Coast Guard uh, officers working in collaboration with illegal fishing um, traders um, and um, seizing their assets under the anti-corruption uh, Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act. So that is one way of addressing this as transnational organized crime. Of course, you can get uh, information from Interpol, from the Multimedia Commission, tapping their phones, tapping their uh, communication systems, and uh, also you need help uh, from the banking services on money laundering uh, and um, the whole network of uh, fish trade. Certified fishers are, uh, on transshipment ships are mixed with illegal fishers uh, and then sold as uh, those uh, with certified labels. So for that, you need to bust the syndicate. To bust the syndicate, you need to make that a transnational organized crime. Uh, and then you bring the land sea nexus, bring all the uh, architecture to bear, and uh, break the syndicate on, on land, and then you can address them at sea. The other one is the destructive fishing. Those who supply the cyanide, those who supply the detonators, the bombs for uh, fish bombing, all that are on land, they are not at sea. So we can actually trace them, we trace the manufacturers, trace those supply lines, and then from there we can uh, uh, get this uh, IUU people uh, on land and address this IUU as a transnational organized crime. And then I go to the, some questions on uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, they talked about uh, handling piracy and uh, smuggling. Same thing. Uh, you see, you talk about Navy and uh, maritime crime. This is a very conservative thought. Uh, this conservative thought sometimes rules uh, the way maritime crimes are seen. Uh, Navy officers uh, do not have skills in uh, handling forensics, evidence, uh, preparing arrest papers, and uh, uh, seeing the public prosecutor in court. Those are done by law enforcement people. So the law enforcement people are actually mostly on land. So you need to work with the police. The police know how the gangs operate. They know how the money is transferred. So if you want to catch people at sea, you need to catch them. The, the, the you don't. You need to go after those with the tie on land, not with the tattoo at sea, because the fellows with the tattoo are also victims of socio-economic disparity. Uh, I hope that answers your question. So uh, don't depend too much on the navy and the coast guard and all that. You need to bring the land and sea together, identify the logistics chain, the demand and supply, and from there you check the bank accounts. You also go and look at corruption of government agencies. You know uh, civil servants who are corrupted. Grab them, freeze their accounts, and put them in jail. Um, then you talk about uh, some other issues on non-traditional and traditional uh, security. Traditional security is state, state actors. Non-traditional is non-state actors. Okay, that's the difference. So when you talk about smuggling, trafficking, you talk about piracy, you talk about uh, illegal fishing and all that, these are all non-state actors. 
these are businessmen. They're big business. Uh, I hope that is answering your question, uh, sir. Uh, what I mean is, uh, is um, uh, maritime security. Do you mean it's, um, it's confined to um, well, like uh, non-state actors, or or it is both? But you uh, limit to uh, non-state actors. Most of the, I'm I'm coming from a law enforcement perspective, not the the state actor perspective. You know. Uh, when you talk about boundaries and all that, those are maritime security in a different angle. The one that I, I handle is law enforcement issues. These are non-state actors. So that's what I meant by maritime security threats that we see today uh, at sea on the three areas that we look at, smuggling, trafficking, uh, piracy, armed robbery, uh, terrorism, uh, and um, uh, illegal fishing. So that's my focus uh, on syndicated crimes. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, I hope I've answered everybody's question. Uh, I, I didn't leave out anything. Uh, just one minute. Let me just look through. Yes, the main aim of uh, addressing maritime security is about going to the root of the crime, which is busting syndicates and not arresting criminals. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the first question, uh, respondent. Gentlemen, with regard to the cooperation possibility and the challenges to the maritime authorities, is that right? As a matter of fact, for the maritime cooperation within the South China Sea region, we do need promote to promote our like mutual understanding, to establish our trust, to build our confidence in each other, and uh, all those uh, what we call Chinese uh, new initiative, like uh, the Belt and Road Initiative or BRI in short, we need to have the confidence. Uh, capacity building, cooperation, and also connectivity. Then we need to find out where the challenges lie in. There are some areas that we need to consider before we start a cooperation or cooperating with each other. Challenges include the misunderstanding between each other, especially when we meet at sea we need to have a kind of a risk management measures in advance or in place. And we do need a kind of a communication channel. The earliest, uh, the early harvest we have established between China and the other countries include the queues between the navies. And also the another area including the hotlines established between or among those diplomatic officials. Yeah, okay, thank you. The hotlines established uh, between among the diplomatic officials. Then we need to follow up with the further negotiation to reduce those uh, potential challenges. That is the, the question I would like to answer you to say. For the second question with regard to our Vietnamese colleague, in terms of the legal framework and the most uh, feasible area for, the, for maintaining the South China Sea maritime security, as a matter of fact <coughs> mentioned in the question one, we need to build trust. We need to build our confidence. And especially China has uh, demonstrated a, a lot of friendship, a lot the in-depth discussion and the negotiation with the neighboring states and the country friends for further cooperation. The BRI initiative includes one of the key elements, which is the blue economy. We share a common heritage in South China Sea, especially China and Vietnam. In that case, China and the neighboring states can work together for the blue economy. So that is the most feasible area we could start with. Otherwise, we need to have further discussion and negotiation for the potential cooperation areas. Thank you, sir. I, I would like to use my point as chairman. I had a hard time hearing yesterday. We're being reminded that there's some difficulty and we're told to speak closer. So if in any of the following presentations and answers you can't hear, please let us know so we can get closer. 
I would if I, there's a point that I think Bob Beckman could help us on that I discussed with him yesterday, and it relates to this overlapping exclusive economic zones between Indonesia and Vietnam and the legal aspect, which he's talking of the code of conduct later, but while we have him here, I think his intervention on this would be most helpful. If I could, Bob. Okay, thanks, Carl. Yeah, Again, can you overlapping EZ get closer. Claims, in overlapping EZ claims there is an obligation to exercise restraint, as suggested by the Vietnamese questioner. I guess I'm not sure of all the details on this. I'm not sure that the Vietnamese vessels have transponders on, so you'd know exactly where your vessels are, if they are in the overlapping area, or whether they're in uh, archipelagic waters of Indonesia. So I think uh, you may be accepting what they tell you where they were when they were arrested, whether they, when you actually know where they were. My sense is that uh, Vietnam would be in their interest to in try to ensure that your vessels do not enter the overlapping area given the sensitivities of Indonesia with respect to IAU fishing at this time. You know, and I've encouraged you, you should be uh, hopefully reaching agreement on your ease at boundary and that would, uh, and then again it's a question of ensuring that your vessels respect the boundary agreements that you have entered into. Um. Yeah, I was also referring to the, the Vietnam wants patrols along the continental shelf area, and there are differences in legal interpretations of where the exclusive economic zone. Yeah, just my knowledge of Indonesia. Indonesia negotiated continental shelf boundaries very early with most of its neighbors. It's now in the position of having to negotiate the water column or EEZ boundary. And as a matter of principle, because it was very generous to its neighbors on continental shelf boundary, it is claiming a wider economic zone than it would uh, as a continental shelf. And I think. Vietnam's position might be that they want the water column boundary and the continental shelf boundary to be at the same line. It's a matter of principle. It's highly unlikely that Indonesia will agree to that. And as a member of the Vietnam negotiating team, the questioner knows this. Uh, it's a very tricky issue. Hopefully the two countries will reach a ease at boundary because they have a common interest in uh, this area. Thank you, Bob. I'll now open it for the second round of questions. We've got just under uh, 15 minutes. So, one, two. Oh, sorry, you've already yeah, had a question. Yeah, I, I, just one, I will two, defer make a and take the gentleman to, um, here. Um, I'll put you third. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, one, two, three, and four. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hideshi Tokuchi. I'm a visiting professor of National Defense Academy of Japan. You know, uh, today, uh, you know, uh, this panel is talking about uh, various important things like, you know, shipping, uh, fishing, and, uh, you know, counter-terrorism and counter-piracy. Uh, they are very, very important. And at the same time, uh, we shouldn't forget uh, the uh, importance of, uh, you know, uh, the safety of air traffic over the uh, South China Sea. I agree with uh, Captain Sebastian uh, about the importance of holistic approach to include uh, land and uh, sea in the same uh, security scope. That's very important. If so, we should uh, in even include uh, air safety uh, in the same uh, consideration. Uh, the, uh, the incident of Malaysian uh, aircraft uh, 370 clearly shows that this region is not only, uh, this region is uh, blind not only at sea but also at the airspace. Thank you. Uh, Michael Kovrig with the International Crisis Group. Uh, question mainly on, again, the issue of uh, fishing particularly. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the prospects for uh, possibly using greater levels of public education both within countries and across the region. Um, also looking at behavioral economics, uh, economic
economic incentives, as well as greater sort of public education campaigns to try to shift public attitudes that which would in turn help the enforcement efforts in terms of particularly curtailing overfishing and inculcating greater understanding in the region about the need that, that is in everyone's interest, in effect, to manage fisheries effectively. Um, whether you've seen any examples of that in any of the countries or if, if your research otherwise has any insights on the prospects of that kind of cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, well, I just want to uh, make a comment, a uh, brief comment concerning what uh, Professor Beckman uh, had just said. Well, he uh, yeah, basically right, but uh, in uh, when it comes to the uh, overlapping EZ, the, well, the coastal states concerned or the state concerned are also under the obligation to make every effort to reach uh, a provision uh, arrangement pending the final solution to uh, the area. That's the one point. And in addition, when it comes to uh, the point which I made uh, earlier relating to uh, the Vietnamese fishing vessels fishing in the overlapping EZ caught by the, um, uh, Indonesian um, uh, maritime law enforcement is something which uh, well, our law enforcement uh, well, agency have had the evidence. It's, it's, it's not something which is uh, unfounded. So just my comments. Thank you. Thank you. And the football? Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, such a uh, elaborated uh, presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one for Professor Zhang Renbin. Uh, why you are <coughs> addressing to uh, shipping cooperation in the South China Sea, and especially in your presentation, you did not, uh, on your slide, you mentioned connectivity, but I, I just wonder, perhaps uh, you can help us get to know from Chinese government perspective, how exactly through uh, Maritime Sea Road, developing connectivity uh, on the way uh, to gradually ease, ease down uh, the tension in the South China Sea. And I think this is a particular point in the region. Every one of us are looking into how much uh, Beijing will be able to help uh, low, low down the tension. And I think uh, this is uh, directly related to shipping, uh, security, and, and safety. So I, I, I note uh, from the private discussion you have uh, already uh, enlightened me a lot uh, on this particular part, and I hope uh, perhaps uh, on the policy front, you can help us uh, get to know a little bit more about the new direction. And the sec second question is for Martin. Um, lately, as a uh, um, country and also Iraq have uh, already claimed the victory against a terrorist group, uh, ISIS, and many of us are now in Southeast Asia worrying some of uh, their warriors may be returning back to the region. And you are talking about piracy and uh, terrorism. Uh, for almost a decade also, in the region, we have uh, addressed to maritime terrorism, the possibility of that. And I, I think perhaps uh, from Malaysia and Singapore, for quite some time, um, looking into the level of uh, possible uh, maritime terrorism, and I think your presentation also addressed to that. But I, I perhaps would like to ask you to update us how uh, high uh, possibility that uh, maritime terrorism may be happening in the region. And if uh, something really comes, comes to us, how exactly the region uh, would be able to respond in such a way. And hopefully it will not occur. Thank you. Okay, I called uh, an end of that round, but I'm going to ask one question because uh, it was raised here to, to Shafia to, to address what would be the practical arrangements you would suggest between Indonesia and Vietnam pending negotiations on delimiting the EEZs? Okay. Uh, who would like to begin? Okay. Martin will start off. I think I will hop on the question from first. Addressing the IU issues at home. 
when you address the crime, you need to look back at land and sea. You need to look back at the fishing industry itself. Is the fishing industry a lucrative industry for fishermen? You need to do a value assessment. US AIDS is carrying out a project. It's called bait to plate. So bait to plate, meaning that you need to see the value assessment of the fish, uh, fishing. Fishing, four phases, extraction, processing, marketing, distribution. Which part is the fisherman doing? And which part are the contractors doing? So the suppliers doing? Where's the cost to the fisherman? What is the consumption of uh, uh, protein for the country? You need to do all this assessment. Where's the fish stock assessment? Where's the maximum sustainable yield? Where are the sciences of your estate? You need to do that. You need to identify all this back home and then manage your fisheries, uh, monitoring, control, surveillance of fishing vessels. If you can do all this, then you can put more fishermen out there. The more fishermen out there, they become eyes and ears for law enforcement. So you spend less money on building Navy ships and Coast Guard ships and all that. You can even do private uh, security, flying uh, unmanned vehicles for air patrols, creating deterrence. The, the same monitoring control surveillance that you use for fishermen for search and rescue is the same MCS you require for certification of that fish for export. So you're talking about export, you're exporting to premium markets. And if you can enter premium markets, your fishermen actually are becoming rich. If you can certify the fishes that they catch, they're not only for food security, also resource security, for tax purposes, for export purposes. So all this comes from proper management. The problem here we have in maritime security is governance. It's not a problem of security. If you can govern um, your, your estate well, from proper policies and proper domestic legi regu legislation. You spend less money on risk and you spend less money for security. Um, I will take on uh, the professor uh, on uh, maritime safety, uh, air safety. Uh, I co-chaired a CSCAP study group on harmonizing aeronautical and maritime search and rescue. IKO and IMO have come out with distinct search and rescue uh, parameters which both of them conflict. The FIR uh, for IKO and the SRR for IMO they conflict in so many ways that uh, the boundaries for search and rescue are sometimes uh, in conflict. So we say we need to harmonize uh, in line with the International Aeronautical Maritime Search and Rescue Manuals. We need to look back at capacity building. We need to look back at training. We need to look back at alert system, communication systems, responses, and those kind of stuff. So we are promoting Joint Rescue Coordination Center instead of separate aeronautical maritime, separate maritime rescue coordination center. Sorry, air, air, aeronautical maritime, aeronautical rescue coordination center, and maritime rescue coordination center. Because if, like in MH370, if the aircraft go to the sea, then the aeronaut catch up with information, and the media release is converted, and, and you know, training is not properly done. So this is one way ASEAN can look at uh, the experience from Basarnas, Badansa National Indonesia, where QZ8501 Air Asia went down in Java Sea, uh, Indonesia conducted the search and rescue very well. No issues at all. Why? Because one stop center report direct to president. So in this way, when you talk about maritime crimes, it's about time uh, we set up our own single maritime point of contact, report directly to the head of state and uh, 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 organized body. This way we can address the land sea nexus, we can address corruption within civil agencies, we can address the supply demand chains and all that. One thing I missed out in IUU issues just now is live fish trade. Live fish trade is an organized crime. The, 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 the fish is, uh, is uh, they, they put in the cyanide at deep waters, take out the fish, live fish. For example, the endangered Napoleon rest is sold in, in uh, countries for 300 US dollars per kilo. And these are endangered species. So we need to make it a uh, transnational organized crime to address all these issues. Um, otherwise, I think uh, the more important issues that we need is to use the social network, to use the media, to use all other panels uh, that we can, structures, to build capacity, to identify syndicates. To me, I don't think we should go on arresting criminals because you're only arresting the pawns. We need to identify the supply demand chain of these syndicates and break them on end. And the only way you can do it is working in collaboration within the region. All single maritime contacts work together, piece the jigsaws, go to the root, identify the syndicates. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Liu, for your excellent uh, question with regard to the connectivity. As a matter of fact, the BRI, the Chinese Mar the, the Belt and Road Initiative has a bit of a vision for the maritime cooperation. And under the BRI, there is another 
initiative called the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. In that case, this also helps connect, to, connect the whole the ports and the routes along the, the coastlines. In that case, by looking at those uh, connectivity, we mean the connectivity of the facilities. As a matter of fact, that's just like a week ago, at this uh, ASEAN China summit, that another memorandum or cooperation has been agreed upon between China and ASEAN, which is, uh, I got the Chinese copy, I don't have the English version, but I would like to translate it into an easy to understand standing way. It's called the Strategic Plan of Transport Cooperation between China and ASEAN. It is whole transportation system cooperation between this uh, area, countries. In that case, it involves a lot of uh, areas like uh, air, road, railway, waterway, as well as the maritime transport. For this uh, maritime uh, Silk Road connectivity, we need to understand uh, what's the new direction as asked by Professor Liu. We have a very simple vision, that is the common destiny common destiny is not for only one country, it is for all the countries concerned along the Silk Road. We need to have a, a basic understanding that China has about 60 shipping line voyages every month connecting China ports and ASEAN and Southeast Asian ports. And China has a lot of shipping connectivities with the neighboring countries. I mean the most one as a matter of fact, China's ports are developed, developed as a, in a dramatic way. Last night we heard a very recent concept called the smart city by the party secretary. The smart city needs a support of the smart port and smart shipping. In that case, we would like to share the common understanding and connectivity that China would like to help would like to provide and would like to assist all the countries concerned that are in need for their development of port facilities, for the infra infrastructure constructions, as well as for the smart shipping, smart ports. Smart ports has another concept, which, is mean, which means uh, unmanned operation of terminal. We've got three unmanned Operate, unmanned operation terminals already in China. We would like to have this experience shared with our neighboring countries. Thank you very much. We've got four seconds remaining, but I'm going to indulge for just going over slightly. Martin would like to respond to one further aspect of Foucault's question, and Shafia will, will end uh, with her comments. Um, militants are politically motivated criminals. They want to make a political statement. They want to bring the government to their knees. To do that, if their demands are not met, they're willing to do anything to bring the government to their knees. But the thing that drives them is funds, money. Like Southern Thailand, uh, the terrorist group have a different agenda. Mindanao, different agenda. Jama Islamia in um, Indonesia, different uh, agenda. Katiba Nusantara, different agenda. So understand the, um, the the mover shakers for this ideology, you need to start on land. You need to look at the war of the mind. You need to go, it's not war of guns and bullets. It's war of the mind because of ideological uh, beliefs that drive them and the funds that, that support them for their movement, for their logistics and all that. So you need to trace that. You need to work together as a team and uh, identify these networks. And only then you can identify trends. So for me, my advice is identify your interests, then uh, recognize your vulnerability on that interest, put risk mitigation, add on to uh, consequence management, and then stand by for an event. If you don't have all this prepared, then you are preparing for danger. Thank you. Okay, just very briefly, um, public education campaign, um, absolutely, that's um, one of the programs that uh, the
current uh, Minister for um, Fisheries in Indonesia are doing. Um, one of the things is um, basically educating the, the fishermen about the, you know, the, the, the fishing methods and equipments that are allowed. And she has been having a hard time um, with this particular policy because um, you, you see uh, every day there's demonstrations in front of her office from, you know, local fishermen, uh, you know, asking why they can't you know, basically still carry out their, their, their usual method and uh, using their, their usual equipments and why it is now banned. So definitely, but um, what I have to highlight here is that we can only educate our own fishermen, so there, there needs to be a further um, cooperation in this. And to Carl's a question about practical arrangement, I guess the naive side of me would answer, you know, let's not just fish in that particular area, but I guess that that's just not possible. Um, but from um, I, I can't say for, for the Vietnamese side, but from the Indonesia side, um, there has been efforts to actually um, training our law enforcement agencies to understand these sensitive um, issues better and for them to understand the areas that are currently um, um, still going through um, negotiations. So um, that I think is uh, what we can do from our part. Thank you. It's my job to end this session, and I would refer to you to the guidance that the presenters were given to, among other things, uh, really look at key controversies involving fishing activities, anti-piracy, and te terrorism, and with the added responsibility to provide us perspectives and motivations of the stakeholders. And I think from China, Indonesia, Malaysia, we got all that, and we got it very richly. So please join me in thanking our speakers, and I call the session to an end. Thank you, Mr. Chen, and uh, I would like to, we have the coffee break from uh, now in 20 minutes, so we go back here at 10.20 to start with the next, uh, for the next session, session five.